Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, a television program designed to take you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, all in one year. We're very excited to do that today. We're in the book of Job. We're learning some interesting things. Corey, what are we studying today? Today I'm going to be taking a look at some ancient technology that existed during the time period of Job. Excellent, very good. Now you studied today. Yes. What are you going to do? We're going to talk about the symbolism in some of the words that Job chose to use. Excellent. Very good. Ryan, what's up? Well, today I'm jumping ahead in our reading to take a look at Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2? Oh, my goodness. Very interesting. Looking forward to that. Once men respected me, Job says, and he goes back and he looks at the times when he was honored and respected, not like now. Now he's in very much trouble. We'll talk about all of that and more. Get your Bible and your Bible guide out. It's time to study. Today, you and I are going to focus in on a technology that is still used today, but is really quite ancient. The technology behind mining different metals. Now, we're going to be focusing in on the time period of Job, so the time period of the patriarchs, and comparing and contrasting uh, some of the technologies that were going on in that time. Take a look. Perhaps it is the nature of digging into the unknown that makes ancient mining so intriguing. Or perhaps it's intriguing because it is a very recently explored ancient science. Several excavations have explored copper mines known to modern historians since the 1800s, with their ruins of ancient smelting camps in the presence of large piles of their metal waste, called slag. Until excavations revealed the shocking truth, it was believed that the main activities at the sites were from the Roman time period. But with exploration, it has been shown that the complex vertical shafts that lead down to horizontal galleries date to the Catalytic time period, the time period of the patriarchs. At a specific site in ancient Edom, it has been discovered that during the time period of the judges of Israel, Timna was being mined extensively by Egypt and then the Midianites and Amalekites. This is fascinating within the context of the Book of Judges, in which both the Midianites and Amalekites appear in the land against the Israelites. Three types of ancient mining have been categorized by specialists. Open cast mining, meaning the collecting of ore samples from the surface of the ground, Horizontal gallery mining, which is digging horizontal shafts into hillsides to find ore deposits. And the most surprising? Ancient deep shaft mining, cutting vertical shafts down into the ground and connecting these by digging horizontal galleries to collect ore. Once the ore samples were gathered, the ancient miners had to crush and melt the metal in order to remove the slag, the impurity. What was left was a purer form of metal. In another unexpected twist, the methods of smelting from the time period of the patriarchs were compared with the complex methods of Egypt during the time of the judges. The patriarchs method was the simplest, but it produced up to 99% pure copper, while the Egyptian method only managed 92%. Now, it is quite interesting and uh, different to our modern minds to think about this ancient technology being so um, effective and being able to get such pure metal. Uh, now, a lot of times that surprise is our own fault. We have educated ourselves, and we talk about this here on Quick Study a lot, but it's very true. We have educated ourselves in today's modern society to think that the farther back we go in human history, the less efficient and the less right, uh, humanity really was. I mean, of course, we all think, well, they had to survive, so they were really good at surviving. Uh, but in terms of, you know, poetry, art, technology, not so much. 
because we have educated ourselves based on um, an evolutionary model. So from uh, really simple to really complex. So the fact that we can go back in human history uh, thousands and thousands of years, we think to ourselves, well, that must mean that the farther back we go, we're going to see humanity getting less intelligent and less intelligent and less intelligent until we finally get back to, you know, cavemen who don't really speak very much. And we see this reflected in our children's television programs. We see this reflected in our museums and in our artwork as well. Uh, but we have to ask ourselves the question, is this what history is actually finding? And, you know, surprisingly to our minds, that's not what they're finding. Uh, humans from the earliest history are quite intelligent. One of the worst things that can happen to anyone in this life is when they become relegated to nothing. There is no one who enjoys being thrown down in their image to lower, or in this case, the lowest of all. Yet, you know, that's what happened to the man Job. He speaks of times when he respected and he loved and enjoyed, although he did not abuse the times of high respect and did not abuse the times of honor. And now, after losing everything, he is lower than the lowest. He is no longer respected. He is no longer honored. Jesus Christ also became a man relegated to nothing. He was despised and tried as the lowest form of human beings at the brutal Roman cross of crucifixion. Well, Job too was brought low, but never to the death of the crucifixion as the Lord was. Still, Job was made less because his human dignity was despised. He had nothing to show for it. Job 29 verses 1 through 13. Job further continued his discourse and said, O oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness, just as I was in the days of my prime, when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were around me when my steps were bathed with cream and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me, when I went out to the gate by the city, when I took my seat in the open square, the young men saw me and hid, and the aged arose and stood. The princes refrained from talking and put their hand on their mouth. The voice of nobles was hushed, and their tongue stuck to the roof of their mouth. When the ear heard, then it blessed me, and when the eye saw, then it approved me, because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Job chapter 29, verses 1 through 13. We continue in the book of Job, it is great. And uh, this book is, is stunning in many ways, it's amazing. As we look at how God positions himself in this episode, we see that Job reveals the way he was respected as a man in the past. He doesn't doubt God, he knows God, yet something has happened to him and he's lost everything. He's lost his health, he's lost his his sons and his daughters, he's lost his things, and he's a nothing right now. And this is the time when we recognize the absolute need of the human being for God to complete him. 
That's important. Get your Bible guide out. If you don't have your Bible guide, write for it. One of the three addresses in America and Canada in the United Kingdom. Or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you go there, click on donate in any amount, because when you donate, that keeps us going to you, keeps us broadcasting daily. Now, on the program today in our works of faith, uh, this is something that is very, very fascinating. Once men respected me, once I was respected, once men respected me. Now, this is Job speaking, and we are reading Job 29 to 31. We're coming up in the last third of it, looking at Job 29 verses 1 to 13. As we study that, Lord Jesus, help us to hear what you have said. Help us to know what you have done, and help us to be what you have made us to be today. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen carefully to Job chapter 29, verses 1 through 6. Job further continued his discourse and said, Oh, that I were in the months past, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, when his, by his light I walked through the darkness, just as I was in the days of my prime, when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were around me, when my steps were bathed with cream and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me. Man, this is intense. See, we must remember there is a way to show respect that is unequaled in the material world. It's unequaled. We must become spiritually aware of God. This is a really important point. We need to really think this through. I, I want to, to mention, when we become spiritually aware of God, it's like God is always with us. And we recognize, and the Holy Spirit helps us, God is everywhere. When I get up in the morning and I, I think about it, I, I realize the Lord is there with me. And it's just a, a kind of a hushed time. And I say, Lord Jesus, thank you. I have no idea where you're at, but I know you're here. God is with us all the time in our life. Every second of every day, God is there. We need to become spiritually aware of God. And Job is, that's becoming real to Job. It's going to be really real in 42. Anyway, we go on in the scripture. We see in Job 29, 7 to 10, it says, When I went out to the gate by the city, when I took my seat in the open square, the young men saw me and they hid. And the aged rose and stood. The princes refrained from talking, put their hand on their mouth. Job must have been very important. The voice of the nobles was hushed and their tongues stuck to the roofs of their mouth. Now, this is important. We must learn that people listen to real wisdom, real wisdom. But wisdom is exclusively exclusively from God, not from ourselves. There are many people, and you, 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 know, you say to somebody when you're getting on to them or whatever, get wise, you know, but wisdom comes from the Lord. You know, wisdom is an interesting meaning. When you look up the word wisdom, it means it has a spiritual element to it. It means being aware of the spiritual world, being aware that God is God, and the enemy is a fallen angel. There is a difference between God, the one God, and the angels. A big difference. My God is Jesus Christ, God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. That's my God. And everybody else, I mean, if they want to serve the angels, go ahead, but not me. I don't pray to angels. I pray to God. Because God said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Me and I, very important. That's the scripture. And so we need to understand that, beloved. Job remembered the times when he was known and well-known. Then we go to 29, verse 11. He says, when the ear heard, then it blessed me. When the eye saw, then it approved me. Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper. The blessing of the perishing man came upon me 
and I caused the widow's heart, the widow's heart to sing for joy. Now, this is amazing, beloved. We must understand that natural emotions are tuned or turned supernatural when we are wise and directed by God. Natural is turned to supernatural. Our emotions are supercharged by God. God loves it when we pray for things that he desires. God desires that no one perish. Pray that everyone comes to know the Lord. The people we walk by, the people who are going by the channels right now, flipping the buttons, and you stopped on me just for a second. God desires for your soul. He desires you to know who he is. Jesus Christ is the Lord God Almighty. See, we need to understand that and invite him to come into our heart and be our Lord. Because as we do that, as we understand that, then God has freedom to work in our lives, beloved. And when he has freedom to work in our lives, everything is great. Very important that we pray according to God's will. He takes our emotion and he charges it and makes it super emotion because we are aligned with God's will. That's, by the way, what praying is. Praying is aligning yourself with God. Very important. And as we do that, the Lord begins to speak to us and we begin to pray for people. Boy, that's great. God is great. continue on in studying the book of Job as we come up to the end, and we're going to look at that next time on Quick Study, so make sure you get ready and put your PBRs in place, because this is going to be a very good next couple of days. Right now, here's Ryan. Ryan, what's up? Well, I know we're not quite in the book of Psalms yet, but I just couldn't wait. So today I'm beginning a special series on the book of Psalms. Now, one of the amazing features of this book is the incredible messianic prophecies contained within it. In fact, these messianic prophecies can be found as early as Psalm chapter 2. Let's study. Jewish scholar Arnold G. Fruchtenbaum summarizes the Psalms of the Bible as poetic versions of the messages of the Law and the Prophets. The whole book of Psalms, he says, is full of profound doctrine and deep spiritual truths couched in poetic terms. As with the Law and the Prophets, the Psalms also contain Messianic prophecies. Indeed, as early as Psalm chapter 2, we find prophecies of the future Messiah. Verses 7 to 12 read, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. First, it is important to realize that this passage cannot be referring to King David since he, though mighty, was never given authority over all the nations, nor did he rule the ends of the earth. These words are in fact referring to the future king of the house of David, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Indeed, verses 7 and 12 both refer to this future king as the Son of God, a title given exclusively to the Messiah. Also, the Messiah, as revealed elsewhere in scripture, will inherit the nations and have the entire earth as his possession. Verse 9 is also a clear reference to Jesus Christ. It reads, You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. 
The book of Revelation in at least three places tells us that Jesus Christ will rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Psalm chapter 2 clearly teaches that the Messiah would be the Son of God, will be a king in Jerusalem, and will rule over the entire world. The book of Psalms is amazing, and though it is a great devotional book, it's actually so much more. As Messianic Jewish scholar Arnold Fruchtenbaum puts it, the Psalms are really poetic versions of the messages of the Law and the Prophets. It's true, the Law and the Prophets prophesy of the Messiah, and as we've seen, so does Psalm chapter 2. More on the Psalms next week. You know, the Psalms are amazing because they're songs, songs like music, <laughs> written to praise God from many points of view. Uh, from your depressed to your excited to all of these different points of view. And there are 150 psalms. This is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And actually, you got to jump on it, so that's good. <laughs> I that's very good. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah no, it's not. <laughs> it's listen, right. I, I understand. I mean, the psalms are great. They, they are really great. are. Yep. It's my favorite, you know, book of the Bible. I read, I was up to Psalm 21. After I read Psalm 20, there was no way. I read Psalm 21. I couldn't do it anymore. I had to give my life to Jesus Christ the Lord because it was just, I mean, I was just so wrecked inside and I didn't know the Lord, and it was uh, part of the responsibility that I was doing. And uh, so I gave my heart to the Lord in Psalm 21. It was very interesting. Very powerful. And, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it was. God did it and uh, changed my life forever. And I've been reading the Psalms ever since. So it's just kind of my, Psalms and Proverbs are my thing. Mm -hmm. And I've re I read the whole Bible, but Psalms and Proverbs are something for me. So yeah, because your direction that you were given was to read Psalm 1 and Proverb 1 on the first day of the month, and then... Psalm 2 so, and Proverbs 2 on the second, on the second day, day, and so on and so on. So by the time I got to day 21, man, I, was, I recognized that a hole in my soul in about day 10, or yeah. day 15. I was like, this is crazy. I was a preacher's kid, and this is crazy. And uh, the youth pastor got me to do it, Dave Yanatone, who's in Florida right now. He's an excellent guy. Anyway, um, he, uh, he said, you know, I was going to do this with you, but you can't handle it. And I said, I can handle it. Boy, I, I couldn't handle it. God had to handle it for me. So anyway, uh, by the time I got to 21, I said, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I'm so destroyed by these psalms that I realize who I am. And you know what happened? The Lord changed me forever. And I will never forget that time at 7.30 in the morning when he just totaled me. And I was just crying like a baby. I was going to school crying because uh, the Lord had just done a number on me. And all day long, it was very hard. I just couldn't keep my emotion. And uh, that's when the Lord said to me, you know what? You need to take the Bible to school with you everywhere you go. So I said, okay. And my dad knew something was changed. And my mother, she knew something changed about me. But then that Sunday, I saw the pastor. Um, and he worked for my dad. And, uh, you know, Pastor Dave Yannaton, I, I get emotional, so I got to be careful here. But he was across the, the church. And uh, he looked at me. And when he looked at me, he knew something was changed, and I, I began to cry. And he, he ran over the pews, and he grabbed me, and he said, I knew it. I knew I would get you, and Jesus Christ would save you. Well, I mean, you know, that's what happened, and uh, you can invite the Lord into your heart right now. If you just do that, if you say, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my life, the Lord will take care of you. He will change you. That happened to me 41 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I praise the Lord. He has done amazing things in my life. I have two beautiful kids here, one right there and on the camera, and a beautiful wife, and God has done amazing things. So mm -hmm. he's anyway. A, he's a good God, isn't he? He's an amazing God, amazing God. And this is really why we have devoted our very lives to bring the Word of God to you, because it, as it revolutionizes our lives, we know that it will do the same for you. And we hear and so appreciate your testimonies when you write into us or you phone the office and you tell us how that God is transforming your life. And uh, it's true. His, his word is living and active. It's not an old book um, that we need to leave on a shelf and let the dust collect on it. We need to pull it out and read it and uh, with that, you know, it's, with it's, that it's, heart of, of wanting to know who God is. It's true. And, and to say that 
life has been easy. Mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't always been. There's been difficulty. Mm -hmm. And uh, but God helps you through it. That's exactly right. You, he you, gets you through it. Yep. You're, you never have to face anything by yourself. You Absolutely. still will face trouble. Not but, by yourself. But not by yourself. And when you come out on the other side of it, you're much stronger, not because of who you are, but because of God. And uh, that really is a testimony from, I, I know that everybody who has been serving the Lord Jesus, anybody who's given their heart to him can say the very same thing. Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. So we're all growing together. Well, hey. There's symbolism in Job's words that he uses today in Job 29, verses 18 through 20. You know, he's speaking in his own defense, and he talks about how good his bygone days were. And you know what? We do that a lot in mm -hmm. our own lives. We think, oh, well, it was so better then, or I was so much more successful then. Because of God's blessings and Job's righteousness, Job really expected to live a long and healthy life. He was doing everything right. And so I can imagine his turmoil and him trying to figure this out. So as he's talking about God's blessings, he comes down and he says, Then I said, I shall die in my nest and multiply my days as the sand. My root is spread out to the waters and the dew lies all night on my branch. My glory is fresh within me and my bow is renewed in my hand. Sounds like a, a different way of expressing um, your life and how it plays out. But the nest um, presents a secure image of home and family. So he, he thought that, that he would die within his home and surrounded by his family. The sand symbolizes things too numerous to count. He says, and multiply my days as the sand. He thought he would be living for days more than you could ever count. The root speaks of health and prosperity, as well as Job's righteousness, and the bow symbolizes strength. So as you read that again, you can really see where Job's heart was in this and how he was just struggling with what is going on here. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. And and that's really something that we need to uh, emphasize. Job was struggling in this whole thing. We remember that he is somebody who's a human being. Yeah. And for him to be able to uh, survive this was just ridiculous, but he did. And at the end of it, he is saying, you know, I want to see God. Well, God interrupts Elihu and God begins, he talks to Job. Yes. And he says, prepare yourself, Job. I have some questions for you I want to ask you. <laughs> and it is really interesting. We're going to get into that into the next couple of days. So stay tuned.